So you get signed to a record deal. All of a sudden, you have a, a Porsche and, and, a, and a nice house. Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> I still had my uh, Toyota Corolla liftback that could fit two AC30s in road cases, which was very handy. Um, no, the... You know, the, the record deal, it seemed like it took forever to, to you know, get the legal part down. Uh, fortunately, Chris Hillman knew lawyers, and he knew how all that kind of stuff worked. So I, I just kind of followed along, you know, and tried to learn as much as I could. And and then we did our first album. Um, Paul Worley and Ed C. came out to California, and we recorded it out there because that's where we all lived. Mm -hmm. Then you're waiting for your first single to be released, and the first single was Ashes of Love. And that did pretty well. I mean, it got in, it was a top 30 single, you know, nothing to, you know, go crazy about, but at least they played it. Yeah. And then uh, the second single, and this is, you know, by now, you know, through 1986, I think, is when we recorded the album. You know, the idea started in 1985. Uh, 1986, we're recording. Finally, uh, you know, a single, first single comes out, or maybe uh, Lover United comes out in maybe spring, maybe, of, of 87, I think. And we start to tour. We come to Nashville, and we play Nashville Now and stuff like that. And that that record goes up to top five. So now we're, okay, it's, we're like a, a real act. But we're still, like, in a van, you know, playing really funky clubs and... Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, one that I remember specifically, it was in Tupelo, Mississippi. It had one of those signs that you pull out with letters that you change, you know, and sort of colored lights around it. And and it's it was really one of our Spinal Tap moments because it said, Ginger the Bear and Desert Rose. <laughs> so the main attraction was a wrestling bear, you know, and we were like, Below that. Now, now, John, I, you know, I saw Ginger the Bear. She was very talented. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, that's terrible. Oh, it was, you know, and, and, and the guys at that club, they had it out for us for some reason. They wanted to get us in some kind of way. Mm -hmm. You know, first thing they did was ask for pot. Oh, I bet you go to California, you guys have some good pot. I'm yeah. Like, no. Nah. Yeah. And then there was like, oh, you're looking at our girlfriends? Like, mm. no. Oh, why? Are they not hot enough? And, you know, yeah. It was like one of those kind of things. They're just trying to start yeah, something. Yeah, so we're just very careful. I mean, the, the good thing that came out of it was there was a pawn shop across the street, and I found a 1958 J160E. <laughs> you got you a big <laughs> For a like under, yeah, under yeah. 200 bucks. A Beetle acoustic. Yep. Nice. Yeah, and that was, I think that was one of the things that got me to get to know uh, Joe Glazier, too, because the bridge was pulling up. Mm -hmm. He fixed it for me, and... Yeah. Still have it to this day. Uh, used it on a lot of records, but um, point being, we didn't make a lot of money, you know, right away. Yeah. So I kept my job at Disneyland, and they were nice enough to give me a leave of absence, you know, when we would tour. We'd get off the tour, I'd go back and yeah. be working there again. So were, were you touring? Like, were you like playing during the week at Disneyland and then during like, or would there be like block tours where you'd be gone for like a month or something? Yeah, like it that? would be more like maybe a couple weeks or maybe okay. maybe three weeks or something like that. It would be like a little trip. So yeah. they would give me what's called a leave of absence, yeah. and then a long term sub would come in and take my place. Yeah. And so that happened for most of 1987. Okay. And then in January 1988, I remember getting a call from Chris Hillman saying, well, congratulations, you have your first number one record. And, and it was one step forward, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, I have a number one record. I'm going to quit my day job. And so that, that's when I, I called yeah. and gave my notice at Disneyland. And... Uh, you know, my parents were kind of like, seriously, you're leaving a job that's steady full time and you have benefits, medical benefits and stuff. Right. Uh, and I said, yeah, I, you know, there's guys that have worked there their whole career. I don't want to be one of those guys. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the job. I really like it. But, you know, and then as soon as we started appearing on television and then they had some parental bragging rights. Well, right. then, it, then it was OK. You know, yeah. that was an OK decision. Yeah. 
So one of the things that you hit on earlier was kind of the the norm in Nashville, and partially because of uh, Jimmy Bowen and and some of the other you know producers that came in from Los Angeles, they started eliminating amplifiers in the '80s, and everyone was going direct. Maybe you had a preamp, EMG, you know, low impedance pickups were kind of and a TC chorus, and it was kind of this was kind of the norm in Nashville. I mean, it was electric drums, it was you know early keyboards. Yeah. And uh, and they were and they were putting you know early reverb and digital reverb you know on on that to try to make it sound like a, a room again, right? And so there was all this going on. So you know amps were called the A things at that point, and they were not <laughs> welcome at all. And so you know guys like Reggie Young had to just kind of you know get get with the program and and you know and, and do the best they can with yeah. with that kind of sound. And and so did you know Brent Mason. So you kind of came in, and all of a sudden you're like I've got you know, AC-30s, and I'm going to play a telly, and I'm not going to do a strat on the notched position. Yeah. You know, with I mean, chorus. I was so, I, so not that. Yeah. And, you know, nothing wrong with it, but it, it just was not the tones that, that I was attracted to. Yeah. And um, I, I was lucky that, like I said, I, I had some success and people liked my sound, so I never got any trouble for that. Yeah. I mean, at at one point, a producer who will remain nameless, he, he he said he hired me because he, he liked to call me the anti-Brent. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's because I brought in the amp and guitars. <laughs> I guess that was the anti-Brent Rowan? Or, or yeah, Brent I think so, because, okay, uh, yes. yeah, because that would have been, um, yeah. you know, I think Brent Mason and I kind of came up around the same time. Right. And we didn't play hardly ever together because we would never be on the same session. A, right. a couple of times we did over the years. And, yeah. and that was always great, you know, really fun. But early on, I guess it would be one or the other. I feel like, um, well, it's not that six-string bass hadn't been used in country before. Because, of course, you know, race is on and all the tic-tac and stuff. But it hadn't been used in the way that I was using it. Yeah. And I was using it because I got inspired by uh, by Dave Edmonds, and he had a couple of records, uh, "Girls Talk" and "Information," mm -hmm. had really cool six string bass parts. Well, then there's also the uh, the the Wrecking Crew stuff, like you have Jack Nietzsche's uh, "The Lonely Surfer," or you have the Glenn Campbell stuff, sure. where, where you know Wichita Lineman, Wichita where he's Lineman. Playing, where he's playing melodic things instead of just doubling the bass. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so those things inform me more than anything else but I would yeah. really have to point to Dave Edmonds for like personally because mm -hmm. I was a fan of his and yeah. um, you know so I went looking for a, a Dan Electro six string bass I wanted a, a longhorn like his mm -hmm. I ended up with a single cutaway like Dwayne Eddy's like yeah. almost exactly like Dwayne Eddy's yeah. um, so I used that you know early Desert Rose Band in fact one of our early singles was a ballad called He's Back and I'm Blue and I started, I always like to use the six-string bass. I started high on the guitar, and then only at the very end of the solo, I went down to as low as you could go. So the idea being, oh, maybe it's just a normal guitar, but then, whoa, whoa what, what's happening? Yeah. You know? Um, and the other thing that was on that track, there was a, a vibrato effect. Mm -hmm. And it was a boss vibrato pedal, which uh, actually created a pitch wobble as mm -hmm. it were and I remember when the you know they were fighting to get this one radio station to add the record and I don't remember what station it was but in those days you know you had to have so many stations add your record so it could go to number one mm -hmm. and this one was just resisting and I found out later that they were resisting because they thought they had a, a record that was pressed out of round because the guitar was wobbly at the front. Boom, 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 Oh, it made me so mad. I was like, "That's I, I did that on purpose, you know? <laughs> you don't get it. <laughs> well, and again, I think I, I heard a sound similar to that on um, It's Only Love. Okay. You know, and I think that was might have been on a Vox amp. It might have been sort of a tube, you know, vibrato like that. But, uh, you know, I always tried to make the guitar, whatever guitar that I was playing, I would try to cast it for the song mm -hmm. and, and have it be not just the guitar, but something else to, to make it, you know, different or special. Yeah. Either a Leslie or, a, you know, like I put a, one song I put a, a Takamini 
electric acoustic 12 string through a Leslie. And it's, it, it sounded like nothing else that I'd ever heard before. Yeah. But it sounded and, good. Yeah. And, and when you played it live, how did you... Did you <laughs> well, I tried, you know, at, when I first started with Desert Roseman Live, it, I just had a, a boss pedal board like this on the floor. It was mm -hmm. a little bit smaller called BCB6, but basically same, like six slots, you know. Yeah. And I would carry two delays because you couldn't program them in those days. I've had mm -hmm. one slow and one fast. So one would be on my setting for price I pay. Yeah. Uh, or Orange and Blossom Special. That kind of dotted eighth repeat where the repeat is just as loud as the original note and there's just a single repeat. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And then the other one I would have set for like a, uh, more just like a slap back. Yeah. And, um, and I had the Dimension C, the Boss Dimension C, which I always loved because mm -hmm. it gave a chorusy sound without it being too swimmy or wobbly, and I'd have the Boss Vibrato pedal for that song. Uh, he's back and I'm blue. I didn't need distortion pedals because nothing I was doing at that time had much distortion on it. I, yeah. I would just drive an AC30 just a little bit, you know. Um, and the reverb that I was using at that time was uh, an Alesis microverb, I think, okay. a, very, a very small a one. Little small. And it was the first reverb that I ever found that had stereo in and out. Okay. Because I would use my uh, my Dimension C pedal for a stereo effect, and I would turn it on, um, like for example in uh, Summer Wind at the end of the phrase, I would turn it on so the last chord would shoot to the side, <laughs> like this big wash just for that chord. Yeah. And if you didn't have a stereo reverb to go into, then that effect it, wouldn't happen. Yeah, it would just, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't get that, that wide stereo No, it effect. wouldn't open up, it would just sit yeah. there. So that was my, that was my setup at the time, and, and then as each consecutive album, like that worked for the first album, and then the mm -hmm. second album had a couple of different sounds on it, and then the third album had yet some more. So I started trying to you know, add things, and I eventually kind of went to the GP16. Mm -hmm. I think I had a GP8 at first because you could program some sounds in there, right. and I remember sitting for hours trying to copy my pedal sounds into this unit. Right. And then uh, the GP16, it had a couple of things that, that, that I couldn't do on anything else for on um, Start All Over Again, which was a Rickenbacker six-string through this uh, sort of a chorus effect, I was trying to copy my Dimension C, but I could put the speed on a pedal. So it was a little bit like a Leslie, mm -hmm. you know, but you had variable speed, yeah. you know, so I would change the speed while I was playing those riffs in that song to, to create yet another kind of yeah. different wobble, as it were. Yeah. Yeah, so your rig had to get more and more complex as, as you were making these records, and so, the, the Desert Rose Band is, is going along, and then uh, Chris got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with the Birds. Yeah. Yeah. And that was 1990 or 91, I think. Yeah. And uh, it was right around the time of the Iraq War, too, I remember. It was like a strange, yeah. strange time. Um, yeah, and certainly, you know, Chris being a, a former bird and... and and Burrito Brothers and all that. I mean, there's a lot of things about his history that people don't necessarily know. They know he was in the Birds. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't know that he kind of brought Graham Parsons into it. Mm -hmm. He also brought Clarence White into play right. early on. Um, he kind of he discovered Emmy Lou Harris mm -hmm. and recommended her to Graham. Yeah. So it kind of started her career. I would say he started my career as a you know international musician because. I, you know, I got the record deal. I mean, I, I won't say it was because of him, but certainly his fame, you know, helped that along. I mean, the band was actually my idea. Mm -hmm. So I kind of helped him in a way too, because uh, Desert Roseband was probably his most successful act for him as an artist because he was the lead singer and the main writer. Right. And in most of the other bands he was in, he wasn't. You yeah. know, in, in, in Burrito Brothers, he shared it with Graham. I would say it was like, you know, even. Yeah. But Manassas, yeah, it's going to be Stills, it's, you know. It's his band. Yeah. And uh, Souther, Hillman, Fure, it didn't really take off, you know. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, 
it isn't much longer after you you kind of start getting more into the into the session work and then also the the desert rose band kind of uh you you leave the band JD yeah. leaves the well JD leaves the band first and Tom right. Brumley comes back comes in from from yeah. the Rick Nelson band yeah and that was and, pretty cool that uh it's a nice way for that circle to kind of come around yeah. um yeah I, I enjoyed that chance to play with Tom uh at that time I saw country music going in a direction that the Desert Rose Band didn't really fit in okay to my ears and, and and we were getting encouraged to sort of try to go back to our first album sounds. And I don't think it's ever possible for any artist or anyone to go backwards. Mm -hmm. You know, you can try to revisit your past, but everything's different. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like it was when you were there. So that, that's really odd for it only being like four or five years and they're wanting you to revisit a uh, first album. That's yeah. kind of strange instructions. Yeah, or, or it was. It, it, yeah. it felt strange to me and, and just against, you know, everything in my mind was like forward, forward, forward. And I was mm -hmm. wanting to explore more different guitar sounds and, you know, in the later Desert Rose Band things, I was using some distortion and, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of solos I was really proud of, uh, they never got that much attention because, uh, I, well, who knows, but one was on a song called God's Plan. And I, I just think it's, I, I really like my tone. I like the phrasing. I like how it's how it builds the song. Yeah. And and also a song called uh, Come a Little Closer. And both of these are like overdrive sounds, you know. Yeah. And, and so I, I felt I didn't want to be restricted to only clean sounds. I, I love clean sounds, but I didn't want to, only do that. Mm -hmm. So my guitar playing mind was really pushing forward. And of course, I, you know, like I said earlier, I started with rock and that's always what I, I love too. Yeah. You know? And, and not, not that I don't love everything else, but uh, you know, that's, that's what probably inspired me to play guitar at first. So at that time I had met, again through Kitra, she introduced me to Jerry Donahue. Uh, probably in 1985, maybe or even 84. And I became friends with Jerry and I thought he was an amazing guitar player. Mm -hmm. And I really liked his compositions too. Like King Arthur's Dream, I thought it was just a beautiful composition that mm -hmm. inspired me as to what you could do on the guitar as a composer. And, and then also at that time I had met Will Ray there was a very active scene around the Palomino, and I played there a lot, um, really, you know, before and during Desert Rose Band and after. And Will, I met there, he was playing with a number of different other bands, and the first time I saw him play, he was using one of those vibrato pedals mm -hmm. with also like a, a hip shot B bender, and he, he's a quirky player, so his style caught my attention. Yeah. And we became friends. And so the three of us uh, decided to play one time as part of the Barn Dance, which was a weekly show there featuring various different singers. And it was a smart business model because all these different artists would bring their friends. Right. You know, and you might have, I don't know, 15 different acts on a night, you know, so you get a lot better chance of filling the place. On an off night. It would always be like on Tuesday or something like that. Yeah. So we decided, why don't we do something for fun? We'll just play with guitars. We won't have singers. We'll let these three guitars be the voices, mm -hmm. like Three Dog Night or the Three Tenors or something like that. And and it was, you know, I thought, okay, people are going to expect a bunch of chicken picking and blues and jam stuff. I said, let's not do that. Let's actually do songs, you know? And I knew Jerry had the songs because of his album. He, he had an album called Telecasting. Yes. And that's where King Arthur's <clears throat> Dream came from. And, you know, it inspired me to write. So I wrote uh, Back in Terra Firma and Highlander Boogie, I think. And, and Will wrote Helicaster Stomp and, I don't know, something else. So we had, we had a set of, you know, like a half hour set or something of, mm -hmm. of enough instrumentals to... Uh, to do this thing, and then we finished our our set, and all these people came up. When are you guys playing again? That was amazing. I got to tell my guitar playing friends, and and we said, well, we're not. This was just a one off for fun. 
Yeah. And I said, no, no, you have to do it again. No, my friends have to hear it and such and such. So at that time, I was still in a Desert Rose Band, and Jerry was spending a lot of time still in England. You know, he's American, but he grew up in England. So he'd be back and forth. You know, he played with Jerry Rafferty, Joan Armand Trading, replaced Richard Thompson in Fairport Convention, played right. with Sandy Denny and Fotheringay. You know, very interesting career. Yeah, part of that In that scene. Celtic rock world, yes. kind of. So it, it wasn't that often that we were all three back and available to do something together again. So the, this happened over a couple, couple year time period. And so we played again. And maybe that time or the next time, Michael Nesmith came to see us. And by that time, I'd started playing with Michael Nesmith through John Hobbs, who was a session player. keyboard player and a band leader on a television show called Hot Country Nights that Steve Duncan, J.D. Maness, and I played right after we left Desert Roseband. We started playing on this weekly television show. It was a Dick Clark production. Exactly. Yes. Along with John Goo was the second guitarist, um, Dennis Belfield on bass, and uh, it was really fun. Gene Miller was one of the background singers, and I remember one of the first guests was Pam Tillis, and maybe it was Memphis was on the radio at that time, mm -hmm. and of course I'd played on that record, and I did two v quite different parts. One was a completely detuned open A with my low E all the way down to low A. Right. In like a very strange, and I used the vibrato pedal again yeah. on that. A lot of harmonics and reiki chords and things. And and a lot of reverb too. And then the other was like more like a standard Les Paul kind of solo part. Yeah. Well, I asked somebody at Fender to if I could borrow a double neck guitar so I could detune the one neck and play on the other neck. Mm -hmm. So I did that for the show and, and Gene came up to me and said, Wow, that's amazing. You sounded just like the guy on the record with that. I said, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, I'm glad. Thanks. Yeah, that guy was pretty good. <laughs> yeah. He's great. I, I think he's going places. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, you know, that, I, I can go off on all these different tangents, but, you know, early on, I think maybe the second or third time Desert Rose Band had played live in Nashville, we played, it was an outdoor summer concert series downtown, mm -hmm. near third or something like that. And I remember the gig because Gene Clark came to the gig and it was wow. the only time I'd ever met him. And I was, he, I was really, I was happy to meet him because I, I was yeah. a fan. I still am a huge fan of his writing and he was a really nice guy and you know, so at that time, he was the fourth bird that I had met, you mm -hmm. know. And then also at that, uh, I met Pam Tillis at that show. And she stood out to me because she didn't look like a Nashville girl. She looked like a North Hollywood mm -hmm. girl, you know, from our scene out there. Yeah. And she said, oh, I'm doing this record and maybe, you know, maybe you could play or whatever. And, and as it turned out, Worley was producing her. Who so, you had worked with at the Desert Rose Band. So exactly. You had your in. So I did play on her record. And oh. my wife, uh, now was my girlfriend then, but my wife, Dixie Gamble, was an old friend of Pam and actually had produced her first album when she was trying to be a pop artist, mm -hmm. you know, in the early 80s. So I, I, when we were doing the session, we had cut Maybe It Was Memphis. And I thought, wow, this is... I, this is really good. I think this is going to do well for her. And I don't like to predict, mm -hmm. you know, this is going to be a hit or whatever. But I remember calling, you know, my wife and saying, wow, I think we really have a great record. I think this song is going to do good for her. And, and indeed, it, it, it did. It kind yeah. of started her career in country, yeah. which was pretty cool. So you, you played this, you know, the Helicaster gig, and then uh, Nesmith ends up uh, funding y'all and making, making a record? What yeah. yeah. Um, you know, pro no one would have ever heard of the Helicasters without Michael, I don't think. Yeah. Um, he was a really, really forward-thinking guy. Yeah. You know, very creative. One of the most creative beings that I know. Mm -hmm. um, he was the first person to try to explain to me the Internet. You know, he was all about it. And I had not even heard of it yet. Okay. And I couldn't grasp the concept, and I could definitely not see what it has become. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he was showing me, 
he was, it was dial-up days, of course, and he was trying to show me with CompuServe how you could see an aquarium in Ohio or something. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, A, it didn't work. B, like, why would anyone want to do that? But I didn't understand the ramifications, and he did, mm -hmm. you know, you know, and you know, he, MTV was his idea. Yeah. You know, and, and he, he had his own, like, virtual world called Video Ranch, where you could be an avatar and be walking around this world and see venues and go see acts in the venues. And I mean, it's just so forward thinking. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he gave us a budget and we decided, we had a couple of sessions together with the rhythm section. We had two different rhythm sections. One was Donald Lindley on drums and Donald, he has a special place in, in my heart because he he was one of the first guys to encourage me to do my own music as opposed to being, you know, in a band or, or backing up other people. Yeah. And so at the time he was living in North Hollywood, he was playing, um, I was probably close to the end of my time with Desert Rose Band, but he was also playing with Lucinda Williams mm -hmm. quite a bit. And eventually he moved to Austin with Lucinda. But before that, he was playing a lot with Rosie Flores, and and he was playing. He played on some early solo rock recordings that I just recently transferred from a two-inch tape to Pro Tools, so I can mix it because mm -hmm. I could never afford to mix it back in the day. He yeah. was on drums. Davy Farragher was on bass. Yeah. Davy is from my hometown of Redlands, and we okay. used to jam when we were kids. And uh, of course, now he plays bass for Elvis Costello. Um, but they were my rhythm section. Mark Mancina was the keyboard player who's a big time film composer now and does Lion King and Moana and big Disney films. And so I, I had a pretty good band back then. Um, but the first Helicasters gigs, that was the rhythm section. Okay. And then they did some of the album and then the other half was Steve Duncan and Dennis Belfield. So we kind of did, I think, two batches of sessions, as, as far as I remember. And we would put down whatever main guitar parts that the others had to sync to. And then we would each go into our home studios. Or I didn't even have a home studio at that time, but Will did and Jerry did. And I was uh, allowed to use a studio from Michael Lloyd, who's a amazing producer. Michael... His first hit was with Lou Rawls when he was like a teenager. He kind of grew up with the Beach Boys that, that age. And okay. he did all the music for Dirty Dancing, okay. Carlos Belinda Carlisle, uh, you name it. So many different things. The Osmond Brothers, uh, all kinds of stuff. Well, he would let me use his studio when he wasn't using it. And so I cut my parts for the Helicasters' first album in his studio. And... Um, do you mainly use this guitar? Uh, the first, like the first half, I used probably more my Sunburst Telecaster okay. and an AC30. And then the, the sort of the second half, like Orange Blossom Special, Five Minutes to Spare, um, a lot of those songs, I used this guitar and I used a, a matchless amp that has since been stolen, but it was the first matchless single 12. Um, much like this one here, which this is my signature model, has a couple of different things, but the single 12 was very similar to that. Yeah. And that, so that's kind of, at that time, I kind of transitioned from using a 212 amp, like an AC30 or a matchless 212, to, to liking the single 12 amps. And I, I, I kind of remember it happening in the studio with Roger McGuinn. I'd been brought in to play on his album Back From Rio. And of course, Roger was playing his 12 string and had a lot of those great parts. And so I would I would try to add different sounding parts to that mix. Uh, and I would use uh, even strats or six string bass or um, my Epiphone Yellow Submarine guitar, mm -hmm. it's kind of a casino with P90s, yeah. and all, all through that single 12 matchless. And I really, I liked how that sounded on stage too. Strangely, it was more directional and more focused. 
on stage than a 212. Mm -hmm. So that kind of became my Helicaster setup. Yeah. Was, uh, would be this guitar, the GNL ASAT, and a single 12 matchless. And then I would always have another guitar set up with a two point pivot vibrato system. And the first one was a prototype Comanche mm -hmm. that Leo Fender had given to me. He, he was designing this new model of guitar and he had me come down to GNL and he had three of them there. And they had a uh, half coil, like they, they called them Z coils. They're kind of split. They look like a P-Bass pickup, or like what you'd see on an electric 12-string from the from the 60s from Fender. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. exactly. So he had three of those uh, Z-coils, he called them. And so the differences between these three guitars were the switching network. Some of them had switches for each coil. Mm -hmm. And then some of them were, one was very simple with just a five-way. And then the one that I ended up liking was one that had the five-way plus another, another switch. So you could have the front and back together or all three pickups okay. together. I found that using those coils separately, uh, it, didn't, it didn't really work. There was too much of a tone difference when you changed from the, <laughs> the G string to the D string. Okay. It would radically change the tone and right. was kind of off-putting. Yeah. It sounds like a fun idea, but... Yeah. But anyway, at the end of that, you know, I took them out and played them at a club gig with Dale Watson at the time, who I was producing and was a friend of mine at the time, and came back and said, I really like this one that has a five-way and one switch, and I really, really like this guitar. Can I keep it? Mm -hmm. and he said, okay. And it was unfinished body, nothing, like no logo, nothing on the headstock. It's very, very prototype looking. Metal pick guard, these three Z coils, uh, a two-point pivot vibrato system, and then it had a master volume, a bass roll-off, and a treble roll-off. Okay. So that's the guitar that I used for anything that, that had a whammy in it. Uh, King Arthur's Dream and Passion on the first Helicaster's album. Mm -hmm. Son Becomes Father on the second one. And um, eventually, after Leo Fender passed away, um, Jerry had always been trying to get us all to be Fender endorsers. Mm -hmm. So, and, and Jerry's a very, very tenacious person. So he, he never let it rest. And finally, after Leo Fender passed away, uh, they changed hands, GNL changed hands, and their, their artist relations was not very good to okay. me. And a few things happened. They, they brought out a signature guitar for me, without my consent, basically. Wow. We had been working on one, mm -hmm. and my idea was to have a, a ghost coil under the pick guard so you could have the same tone but with some more hum canceling. Right. We could get the output or we could get the tone, but we'd never been able to get both. Mm -hmm. So it just sort of rested at that. Well, they just went ahead and basically put out this guitar with my signature on the headstock, and... I found out because someone saw it at the NAMM show and told me about it. I was like, wow, okay. Well, there was no contract. There was no nothing. Wow. And uh, and at that time, I was about to tour with Elton John. And I, I said, you know, I'm about to do a big tour with Elton John. Would it not be a good idea for me to have one of my signature model guitars? Oh, we didn't send you one? Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> so after a year of trying to get a contract and trying to work out something, and also referring other guitarists like Elliot Easton and, and uh, Clint Strong and various different people, Ray Volker, to, to them, and them not returning their calls. Yeah. It was embarrassing, and I was just like, mm, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, it's t okay, Jerry. <laughs> Let's go to Fender. Let's go, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I needed to have something that would do what this does and needed to have something that would do what that Comanche prototype would do. So they said the first, the quickest thing we can do for you guys is uh, do a, a limited edition series, which they would do each year. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a, a 10 or whatever different artists would do a limited edition series of their guitars. So they did. Uh, the only other band they had done was the Ventures. And so here was the, the Helicasters were the yeah. next band, and we had 
a set of Helicasters, limited edition guitars. Right. And they said, is, you can do whatever you want, as wild as you want to be. So I knew that I needed a Fender now that would do what that G&L had done. Mm -hmm. So I designed my signature Helicaster model uh, with split coil pickups. And as you mentioned before, they look like the Fender 12 string. Right. And uh, I had Seymour Duncan basically copy the G&L pickups, but with Alnico magnets. Instead of so, ceramic. Like yeah, that. instead of ceramic. So the, the G&L might be a little better for distortion. The Fender has a very sweet, clean sound and okay. is also good for distortion. Yeah. So everything else is the same, you know, like a two-point pivot vibrato, uh, volume, bass roll-off, treble roll-off, a push-pull pot to give a combination of front and back or all three pickups. Uh, maple body, because that's what the Comanche was, very heavy, mm -hmm. but it, it, it has a particular feedback quality where you can control the feedback really, really well. Wow. And a particular type of sustain. And then the other thing that's unusual about that guitar is it has left-handed headstock. Right. Um, and that came <clears throat> from years before I put together a Strat at some point and there was a music store going out of business. They had a left-handed Strat neck for $25. I'll have that. Yeah. And I liked how it sounded. It just yeah. sounded a little bit different. The strings, the the lower strings being longer. Yeah, having more length to it. Yeah. yeah. So that became my Helicaster setup uh, after the second album. Yeah. And so it was during the making of the second album, that, oh, second Helicaster's album, that Elton John called and asked me to tour with him. And it took me about a week to agree to do it because they said you wouldn't have time for anything else. Yeah. And the Helicasters album, first album had come out and won album of the year and country album of the year from Guitar Player Magazine. And so we were excited to release our second album, which I feel is the best mm -hmm. Helicasters album. It's, most people like the first best, but the second to me we had a chance to develop right. as writers and develop as a unit. And yeah. um, I think that, anyway, that album was about to come out. I was playing a lot of these solo gigs. I had a weekly spot at the Palomino where I could have any other acts that I wanted. And I was playing more rock oriented material as a solo artist. And I was coming back and forth to Nashville a lot for sessions from mm -hmm. Hollywood where I lived. I was working in films. I was working in television. Uh, I, I was a musical director and kind of a uh, musical coach to Delta Burke on a sitcom. Um, I, I remember seeing that did you show. See it? I remember seeing that, that <laughs> show. And I remember, it's like, hey, there's John. You're one of the few people that watched that <laughs> yeah, show. I think I'm it was sure. just called Delta. I think. It was called, you're yes. right, absolutely right, yes. Delta. And, um, and it was, like, again, it was one of those, you know, kind of uh, sitcom things. And then all of a sudden, here's the a band on a stage, and on a little stage, and all of a sudden she'd get up and, well, her character wanted to be a country singer, and, yeah. and she, in real life, kind of wanted that, too. Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, she probably could have been good if she was a little bit less nervous about it, because she got she would get very nervous yeah. at the time. Yeah. But uh, Bill Ingvall was also part of the cast. Okay. And I met him, you know, he, he just had a kind of a small part as her cousin's boyfriend yeah. or something like that. Yeah. But I, I got to know him back then. But... Uh, every day in my life was something was different, mm -hmm. and I really liked it. You know, it really yeah. suited me. I was playing a lot of different styles of music, and so the idea of of stopping all of that to play with one artist as a sideman, I, I didn't like that idea so much. And already, I mean, this sounds kind of braggy, but it's just the way that it happened. Um, I was working a lot with Howie Epstein at the time. Uh, from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, how he was producing John Prine and Carlene Carter, mm -hmm. won a Grammy for his production. I played a lot on those albums. So we spent a lot of time together and became very good friends. Yeah. And uh, at that time, you know, he called me twice, once saying, hey, Bruce Springsteen is putting together a new band. Do you want me to get you an audition? I can do that. And I said, you know, I, I, I really don't. You know, I, I, I so appreciate it, but... yeah. A, nobody's going to like the band after the E Street band. Right. 
No one's going to like that. Mm -hmm. And I just, I respect him a lot, but I just don't love his music enough to give up everything to play his music. Right. You know? So, and then uh, I had a couple calls from some different artists, uh, Patty Loveless, Lyle Lovett, Mary Chapin Carpenter, Winona, uh, asking if I wanted to tour with them. Mm -hmm. and, And I felt like, well, I've already been in the front line of a country act. Yeah. So to, to be a sideman for another country artist seemed like a step backwards. Yeah. And, and again, no offense to any of those people. I like them and, and I've played on their records and they're, they're great. Um, and then I also got a call from Howie saying, Dylan is putting together a band. Do you, you know, do you want to audition for mm-hmm. that? And I said, no, I've, I've played on stage with Dylan before and uh, I, I don't think that would be a good fit for me. And he said, yeah, as your friend, I, I agree with that because he had toured with Tom Petty with, right, with Dylan, with Dylan too, in and, the mid '80s. And uh, again, like a, a total respect, love his songs. Yeah, I think the musically might be a little too erratic for for me. I'm mm-hmm. kind of a perfectionist, and he's not. Yeah, you know, and it's just a, you know, I don't want to be the the guy that's you know the irritating perfectionist guy. <laughs> well, he likes to have a free for all, and he likes to reinterpret songs in so many different ways. Exactly, that, and, and he and, likes to do it on stage. And, you know, fair enough. And yeah. maybe at this age, I might be more amenable to that. But at that time, yeah, you know, I think about arrangements and parts, and that's what harmonies, and all that. That's what yeah. you know lights my fire. So, uh, so when I got the call from Elton. I just thought, oh, I've been turning down all these different sideman kind of mm-hmm. opportunities. Now here's a huge sideman. This is like a giant sideman. So it, it took me about a week to to decide to do it. And and during that time, I was getting calls. Elton wants to know why why you don't want to play with them. I said, mm-hmm. I do. I, I'm, it's amazing, but to, I know that if I let all this stuff go, it's gone. It doesn't wait for you or it doesn't come back. The world moves along and, you know. He had seen me first with the Desert Rose Band playing at the Roxy, debuting our second album, Running. And in the audience was Bruce Hornsby, Nicolette Larson, Dave Edmonds, David Crosby, Stephen Stills, Bernie Taupin, Rose Maddox, <laughs> Elton John. Yeah. And he he came up to me after the show in the dressing room and grabbed my hand and said, brilliant guitar, fucking brilliant. <laughs> wow, <laughs> you're Elton John. Yeah. And that was in 1988, or yeah, I think 88 sometime. Okay. And so I was, you know, I kind of went to some of his shows after that and, and I, you know, he always remembered me and was asked me how the music was going. And I, I got to be friends with Davey Johnston, yeah. his longtime guitarist. And so I was thought, oh, maybe we'll, I'll do something with him at some point. I'll, I'll do a session for him, you know, because I'd played recently on Bonnie Raitt's Nick of Time album. Mm-hmm. Don Was produced it. And then Don Was was slated to produce a couple things for Elton. So I thought, oh, okay, that's how this will turn around. And I did get called for that, but it never happened for some reason. And then years went by, six years went by, and this was before email or anything like that. So Davey moved and his number changed and I uh, just, I don't know, just lost contact and just sort of, I just for, forgot about it, you know? And then he called out of the blue and said, we want somebody that can do a lot of harmony vocals and play guitar and you were the first person we thought of. And so, you know, that sent me on a whole other path. And of course the other guys in the Helicasters were kind of disappointed, but I said, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna still you know, we'll still play when we can, yeah. you know. Um, but that was in, uh, well, late 1994. And then shortly after that, Michael Nesbitt's company, Pacific Arts, got in a lawsuit with PBS because they'd been distributing PBS's home videos. And there was some sort of trouble. And Michael kindly gave us our two albums back, the rights to our albums, because he was going to be in litigation. Right. So he closed down his company. We got the rights to the first two albums back and then made a third album under our own steam, basically. We owned it. And by that time, we were with Fender. And my setup for that was 
uh, a custom shop Telecaster mm -hmm. with uh, two Tele front pickups and two Tele back pickups. It became a my custom shop model. Yeah. And then a limited edition Helicaster model, which was patterned after the Comanche. Right. Um, sable colored, gold sparkle, very, very flashy left-handed headstock and such. And again, still with the single 12 matchless. Mm 